like we have a good number of people and it's kind of leveled out. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Julie Miller. I'm with the Haverford College Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. We want to thank you for joining this webinar on culturally responsive education abroad, addressing explicit and implicit biases with Professor Lucia Bayakanga from the Community College of Philadelphia. Professor Bayakanga is an assistant professor in the English department, as well as study abroad coordinator and Black Studies Community Engagement Coordinator. We'll do a quick tech overview right now, and then we'll move on to the presentation. So if you experience any technical issues while you're in this webinar, please message me directly through the chat function. That can be found at the bottom of your screen. You'll be able to select my name, Julie Miller, from the drop-down list of participants. You're probably familiar with Zoom at this point, but just in case, you can, um, you'll be able to have the option to chat with everybody in the webinar or select individuals. If your connection drops out and you can't get back into the webinar, please email me and I will try to troubleshoot with you. You can respond directly to the email I sent yesterday that had the meeting link in it. And I'll try to remember to drop my email address in the chat again um, once I finish this introduction. So as you join, everyone is muted by default due to the number of participants here today, but we do encourage you to use the chat feature throughout the presentation to interact with each other. So feel free to share comments and questions there um, as the pres presentation goes on. And of course, our aim with this webinar is to foster inclusive dialogue and sharing. So if there are any racist or discriminatory messages during the dialogue, we retain the right to remove participants if necessary. But we do encourage questions and conversation in the spirit of advancing shared understanding. This webinar is being recorded. You consented to that when you joined, but we just want to make sure you're aware. So feel free to turn off your video if you're more comfortable with that, although we do love to see your faces. Um, and yeah, so today's webinar is co-sponsored by three membership networks at the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship here at Haverford College. We are members of the first two and we host the third. So those networks are the Pennsylvania Council for International Education, also known as PACI, the Philadelphia Higher Education Network for Neighborhood Development, known as FEND, and the Community-Based Global Learning Collaborative, known as the Collaborative for short. While these three networks all have different missions, their missions do overlap at the intersection of supporting diverse people working together on campuses and in communities to co-create more welcoming, just, inclusive, and sustainable communities. Again, feel free to message me in the chat or email me with any technical issues. I will now pass the mic over to Sabia Evans, who is a project coordinator who works with the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship on initiatives in Ghana and Philadelphia. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everyone. Um, as Julie mentioned, I'm Sabia Evans. I work on local and international community-engaged initiatives with Haverford, um, where we host the Community-Based Global Learning Collaborative um, and our Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. Um, and the collaborative, as, as Julie was saying, supports a range of learning activities and resources for community organizations and educational institutions dedicated to advance critical, ethical, and aspirationally decolonial community-based learning and research. Um, once as a student and now as a staff member, I've been heavily involved with the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship um, and Bryn Mawr and Haverford College's collaboration with the University for Development Studies Tamale in Ghana called Lahamtai Tuma or LTT. Um, Lahamtai Tuma means thinking together in Dagbani, which is the language spoken in Dillon, um, the town in which LTT's partner organizations host um, that host our fellows as interns are based. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in this webinar on culturally responsive education abroad um, that we have the opportunity to experience today with Professor Lucia Bayakanga. Um, and Professor Bayakanga has emerged as a leader in internationalizing the Community College of Philadelphia curriculum over the past seven years. And I'm thrilled to share this space with Professor Bayakanga and with you all today. Um, we had nearly 100 total registrants, more than half of whom are from the higher education sector based in the US. We also had registrants from K through 12, the business sector and the nonprofit sector. Um, so just to get comfortable with using the chat and to see who's in the room and where our energy is, why don't we all drop in a very brief introduction. Um, we could go with work, location, and maybe a brief mention of what brings you to the webinar today. Um, so I'll just drop an example in the chat now. So I would say something like this. Um, and so I'll just give everyone a full minute or two 
um, to drop those in the chat and just check out to see who's in the room. Great, we can let those um, keep trickling in. Um, but thank you all. Uh, please, as a reminder, keep the energy going in the chat, uh, whether that's good af that's affirmations or good vibes, questions for later, complimentary information or additional ideas. Um, I'll moderate there um, and I'll turn it over to Professor Bayakanga. Thank you, Sabia and Julie. Um, it is wonderful to be here having this conversation. Um, about a very important topic. Um, so I became drawn to a lot of this work based on my backgrounds and some of the experiences that I had um, as a student and also as a traveler. Um, I feel as though a lot of the study abroad programs um, that I would lead in the past and later assisted with, um, there were a lot of things that I did quite naturally um, that helped to inform the design based on my own experiences as a student and as a traveler. Um, but I also had blind spots and, you know, a lot of the faculty we would all kind of talk about how to really meet the needs of our students on these programs um, and, and, and make the experiences that they have uh, safe, as safe as possible for them while challenging them at the same time. So one of the things that started coming to mind or became pretty relevant is that um, there was over the years a mismatch in what we were designing and what the students needs were it started to come out and then we would um, we, we were looking for ways to be more deliberate about how to meet those needs um, so a lot of what i'll be talking about today is particularly about international travel Yes, um, but also best practices in make in implementing these culturally responsive education abroad programs. Um, so there is a quote that I really hold on to as a faculty member who teaches in the English department, but it informs a lot of the work I do as well. Author Chimamandi Gozi Adichie succinctly puts it in her 2009 TED talk. So that is how to create a single story show a people as one thing as only one thing over and over again and that is what they become it is impossible to talk about the single story without talking mm -hmm. about power power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person but to make it the definitive story of that person so in my classes as well as the work i do with study abroad a dj's ted talk is highly used um, and it gets people to unpack some of the single stories that we all have in, in that space. Um, it gets us to think about where we come from, uh, what frames our cultural understandings, as well as misunderstandings, and what informs our knowledge base. Uh, Chimamande Gozi Adichie observes, 
how they are told, who tells them, and when they are told, how many of these stories depends upon power. So that's something that I do want us to consider. Um, while the presentation is focused on best practices, it is important to consider as leaders in this field, um, what are these single stories that we have that inform the way we design, the way we advise, prepare, and prepare our students and ourselves regarding um, these experiences abroad and the interactions that we all have with one another. So studying abroad while Black has been gaining momentum and uh, you're able to find an abundance of resources that are supportive of students' identities, um, but that's not always the case. And I'm gonna be micro-focusing because of, again, my own experience, as well as the population I deal with at my, at my college, community college of Philadelphia is a minority serving institution where about 76% or so of the student population is um, BIPOC. And so a lot of the focus that I, um, you'll notice that I will be primarily focusing on studying abroad while Black because this is the population I, I mostly work with. Um, but it is talking, to the greater idea of inclusivity in a variety of different ways, and we'll talk a bit about that as well. So um, study abroad while Black is something that has been gaining momentum, and but the nature of this clip was to show that a student walks into a study abroad advising office. Um, she has all these questions about where it would be great for her to study abroad she slowly realizes that um, the advisor and her are facing a disconnect, they're facing a challenge. She's really concerned with, is she gonna be safe wherever she travels um, as, a, as a black woman? And so she's naming all of these areas and the advisor is really not understanding and getting her, he's getting frustrated and she's getting frustrated. And so she kind of just storms out of the office and you know, gives, gives up in a sense on the idea of studying abroad. And so the clip there um, illustrates that, illustrates some of the concerns that students have when they come see me, as well as they attend info sessions before they even decide to study abroad. A lot of my students tend to have these questions uh, regarding their race, gender, religion, disability, and safety in the countries of destination, again, before they even consider applying. Um, and, and since um, we'll get to a slide mm -hmm. where we talk about how um, minorities do not travel in terms of st statistically as well as their counterparts, right? Their white counterparts are traveling the same, similarly for men. Um, the face, generally, they said the stereotype of study abroad tends to be a uh, young white, uh, traditionally aged young female. And so a lot of the questions that students tend to have when they come in and see me uh, really focusing on, okay, how do I navigate these spaces when I'm there, outside of just questions about um, how do I fund it? A lot of the questions focus on uh, what this young lady was dealing with in her advising office. Um, and some are really concerned, a lot of the students, that they will face some level of discrimination either during travel or in country. And we've had experiences as a faculty program leader traveling to Tanzania a few times as well as South Africa, we actually have experienced that when students were discriminated against even in the Philadelphia airport <laughs> before we even left the country. So it is a real concern. Um, so let's get back to the show. So studying, um, according to diversity abroad, students are choosing programs, study abroad programs based on climate. As our community of learners with diverse identities, varied levels of ability and socioeconomic backgrounds grow, the success of all students hinges on our ability to create inclusive study abroad curriculum. Inclusion is not optional. Creating programming that validates, challenges and honors uh, diverse thinking is key in positioning our students to thrive domestically and globally. According to NAFSA, 
uh, the Association of International Education Educators, sorry, nationally, the number of U.S. students studying abroad for credit during the 2017-2018 academic year grew. 2.7% from 332,727 students to 341,751 students. Um, this is about 1.7% of all U.S. students enrolled at institutions. Uh, a recent survey found that almost 40% of companies surveyed missed international business opportunities because of a lack of internationally competent personnel. Um, when 95% of consumers live outside of the United States, we cannot afford to ignore this essential aspect of higher education. And so this is just reinforcing the importance of students um, having this experience as they kind of join the global workforce. Um, although diversity is of the study abroad programs are increasing, um, minority students are still greatly underrepresented. And you can see that in, in this image here, I need this out of the way, um, that in 2017 to 2018, study abroad students were 6.1% African American, 10.6% Hispanic, and 70% 70 70 Caucasian. Um, and so on this slide, you'll notice that overwhelmingly students are traveling to Europe and then Latin America, Asia, and Africa, and the Middle East. So how do we impact, how do we also impact when we think about that, what it means to travel to non-European destinations? Or is there a difference in how we're developing programs, how we're framing it for students? How are we um, addressing the things, these single stories that they may hear about certain regions and where to travel, what is safe, um, and even what to expect once they get there? So how do we develop programs that don't simply reaffirm and replicate these single stories? Um, as previously, previously mentioned, uh, CCP is 76% um, students that are minority, of students that are minority students. Um, but what's not revealed here is also how diverse these groups are regarding age, culture, gender, religious, um, religion, sorry, ability, socioeconomic status, as well as travel experiences. And so our programs at Community College of Philadelphia, we primarily like to focus on students who have had no exposure to travel abroad whatsoever. Um, and, and, and that presents itself with challenges because they don't always readily seek out these experiences in the way others would. Um, and then there's, there are reasons why. Um, hopefully when I get to my last slide, the video will play and it, you know, you'll see um, two, two people um, from Black and Abroad, excuse me, talking a bit about why they think um, a lot of African-American students are hesitant to travel and where that comes from. Um, so, you know, we're, we're at those who may have these reservations, but we are finding that um, more students are getting travel experience, even if it's just kind of personally traveling and not necessarily study abroad. So there's something to be said about. But our groups tend to be very, very diverse within themselves um, outside of the context of race. So considering these statistics and demographics, how then as educators do we design more inclusive culturally responsive study abroad programs? Um, and in what ways do program leaders prepare students and themselves for the experiences they will be facing abroad? And the answer to that is what we're all here for, right? Culturally relevant pedagogy is the way um, at the moment that we're talking about framing um, these experiences so that we match these needs. So CRP is really consider using the cultural knowledge, the experiences, performance styles of diverse students to make learning more appropriate and effective for them. It teaches to and through the strengths of these students. Sets pedagogy requires as a starting point certain dispositions towards learners. Furthermore, engaging students' prior knowledge and experiences requires intercultural competence, having or seeking in-depth knowledge of students' cultures, and interacting and communicating with students in ways that are contextually appropriate and effective. Um, according to Dr. Aaron Bruce, 
Chief Diversity Officer at San Diego State University. The future of excellence in our field would be determined by the ability of practitioners to shift from the deficit-based pedagogy that strongholds un underserved student metho methodology, sorry, to asset-based program development. The deficit model of education when applied to study abroad views diverse students as deficient, defective, or in need of fixing, or lacking knowledge or skills valued by mainstream society. A common question in diversity and inclusion work then is, can you design an inclusive study abroad program without knowing the identity of your participants? And their answer to that is called empathy mapping um, as a tool to be able to kind of seek out that information. And that's something that at our college that we kind of have tailored for ourselves over time and have used um, in a variety of different ways. Empathy um, mapping and other empathy mapping and other students' needs analyses are essential tools for study abroad practitioners who design inclusive curriculum. So here's an example of um, an empathy map. It's not the only one out there, but um, we, you know, we at our college use versions of this um, everywhere from info sessions. Uh, we've kind of used some of the questions that are being asked to get uh, at, the, at the core of why students are traveling and why they're traveling to certain regions and what their perceptions are of those regions. Um, and then we kind of have woven it through our, in, our um, interview process, our pre-departure uh, workshops, our academic work, you know, we still have like kind of nuggets of this that are threaded through, as well as when the students return their re-entry. So we're constantly kind of reconnecting back with students and then getting students to uh, consider what they're saying and how, if and if they're growing from the very beginning of the process until, you know, post-trip or re-entry. Um, so uh, this, again, um, this helps, the empathy map helps respond to students' needs. Um, according to Dr. Bruce, again, uh, preparation, facilitating exploration, and guided reflections are useful. Um, you want to be able to make the relevant connections um, so that you're able to fit students' needs ahead of time, right? So in preparation, you want to find allies, seek relevant views of the terrain. Um, can you create that's the question, right? Can you create culturally responsive programming for a community you're not part of? And I think that um, what we do at our college, our institution is um, we rely on the expertise of our faculty who are not just at times area specialists, but content specialists. And so um, our programs tend to be faculty driven, faculty led, faculty initiated. And so, as a result of that, we're constantly building, refining, building, refining everything that we need throughout, throughout the program, right? Um, so that we're able to make sure that all of our students' needs are met, especially after we've recruited them. Um, and one quick note as well about our programs, it, we're rarely really serious about being intentional because our study abroad programs tend to be really short term, two to three weeks at a community college. Um, a lot of the students have other responsibilities. They're not going away for a semester, only a few really do that. And so when we are designing these programs, the academic coursework will last over a semester or so or a summer session. And then the travel component of that gets a bit sandwiched in between um, the coursework. So they do a bit of coursework before they leave, travel, and then return and fulfill the course requirements as well as um, the other requirements. So we're able to kind of effectively thread <laughs> some of these um, questions throughout the process, do check-ins while we're even in country just to make sure we, are, we, we haven't uh, disconnected from the things that our students are experiencing. And so um, facilitating exploration, right? Um, as well as guided reflections. Those two have been really important in our process. Uh, so other things to consider according to the University of Washington Study Abroad uh, program are uh, further expanding your knowledge, 
I think this pairs nicely with making sure you have the relative, relevant connections in country, you know, as, as well, um, that are on the ground. Um, so further expand your knowledge and develop your abilities in supporting diverse students on your program, recognizing that a student's identity can deeply impact their study abroad experience. Um, consider how your own experiences, identities, values, beliefs, and stereotypes may inform your awareness and how you interact with students whose backgrounds are different from your own, which is really, really important for um, our faculty members to hold on to at the college, um, especially if, if the group does not reflect their same experience, their racial or gender um, um, identities. Uh, it is something that we, we uh, have faculty think through a bit. Um, and how they're engaging with their own students before they even leave, just as sometimes part of just basic group dynamics work, right? <laughs> um, because they're gonna be spending a lot of time together. Usually these programs are very intense and you're spending everywhere from maybe seven in the morning till late in the evening together. And so that's a lot of time to, you know, to, um, be around folks that you perhaps have not been around before, not just for the faculty, but as well for the students. So uh, we do take that one, um, the second bullet point, very seriously. Um, and then the third is be aware of and be prepared to connect students of diverse backgrounds with information and colleagues that are available for additional support on campus through internet resources and in the study abroad host country. Um, so some of some of the ways that our program has been impacted um, are listed here, but again, I want to maybe just repeat a few things that are important to remember about CCP. Um, short term, two to three weeks of travel, again, that comes in between the coursework. All our programs are credit bearing. We have a very diverse student body, 76%. I think I've mentioned that a couple times already, um, students, minority students. Um, uh, I talked about there being faculty generated proposals that the faculty lead in the programming. Um, and that's really important. We like to pair um, seasoned faculty, faculty mm -hmm. who have traveled a lot with um, newer faces. Uh, and it becomes sort of kind of informal mentorship in a way to kind of get them into this type of work that, that um, they're interested in, they're curious about, but perhaps don't have as much experience in. So we really like that aspect of our study abroad programs. Um, our, the students pay a really low cost, um, thankful to our grantors <laughs> as a result of that, our funders. Um, so students pay, I would say roughly under $1,000 um, and everything else gets subsidized in terms of the program costs, the travel expenses and the amount that they pay, um, it could be anywhere from 750 to 850 is all inclusive for the entire time that they're there. Um, and we really mean all inclusive activity fees, food, lodging, transport, airfare, all of it. Um, so we, we cover as much as we possibly can um, to kind of take that economic strain off of the students, the financial strain off of the students. Uh, we have a variety of info sessions that are scattered throughout the fall, leading into um, the spring when students are selected and then prepared to leave. Uh, we use social media quite a lot. Um, we use things like WhatsApp to keep the group connected. And WhatsApp has become brilliant because uh, it allows the students and the faculty to stay in contact, not just um, once they return, but along the way, right? Right before they even depart, they're all gathering together, checking in on one another and doing things of that nature, um, telling each other where to buy the, the, you know, certain things. And, and why am I bringing that up? Well, it's also the space where students are able to sometimes vent <laughs> in ways but it's also a space where students are able to connect each other with the resources that they have themselves have, have um, were able to seek out in the, in the host country. And it could be anything from where hair products and needing certain types of hair products, where can they go get a haircut from, you know, 
fill in the blank, um, what restaurants, where is the black community in this particular area? If it's, you know, if they're in, I don't know, Cambodia or Costa Rica, and they're interested in that, all sorts of things. And, and those, while they might seem trivial um, to, to people, really impact how students enjoy and learn about the, about the place that they're visiting. Um, and I think it gives them a fuller understanding once they're able to get into the lesser known areas or the lesser spoken about spaces there. So we, um, again, we've, we do a lot of pre-departure re-entry activities. And so again, throughout paying attention, using that empathy map, tailoring it to our students' needs, um, where we really focus in on things, not just the assessing their personal and their emotional needs, but we're also paying attention to their culture, cultural engagement, um, to how well their academic goals are being integrated, right, um, in a consistent way, their professional development, or any questions or, or concerns that they have surrounding civic engagement, because that's another important piece. Um, a lot of students, when they return, um, that is actually one of their major needs that they want to find out how to extend the experience and how to um, kind of tap back in, give back, and maybe um, be more of an advocate. They kind of shift a bit and become more of an advocate. And I'm going to get into all of what that, you know, means here on this slide. Um, so I would say that one big thing that we noticed that has shifted is our student leadership. And, and I think that um, because we're, we are able to use things like empathy mapping and relevant, you know, culturally relevant pedagogy, it emboldens the student to voice things that they might not normally voice, to be aware of things that they would have, and highlight things that they probably would have pushed to the side in ways. Um, they feel a, a sense of agency um, and they all, not all, but you know, I would say a good number come back um, wanting to get involved and build up their own leadership skills in different ways. So one of the biggest things that have happened has happened over, I would say the last year is the development of a global ambassador student union. Um, a lot of the students have you know, taken the opportunity to create something for themselves where, it, again, they can be um, advocates surrounding global learning and, and specifically for themselves, a support system for themselves at times as well, and, can, and help each other connect to resources and their own particular needs. We do have an alumni that's growing, um, and uh, they are provided a lot of networking opportunities. Um, as well as student conferences. One of the things that we also have done over the years is connect with a local college in the area called University of Sciences. Their students travel abroad, um, but it's, uh, they, they go through service providers. Um, a lot of the work they do tends to be medical missions. It's a bit of a different context of the students than what our students are doing, but when they um, present when they all present at the conferences, they're all pretty amazed at the, you know, the, the type of projects they're getting into, the work being done, and even more their experiences. And a lot of what we tend to hear through youth sciences students at the presentations is they find that our students are afforded the ability to get more culturally engaged in the area that they're visiting, a bit more than they're able to because they're, I guess, you know, their, their, their context is quite different. They're there for a specific project or purpose, and then they, you know, engage with a few members in the local area, and then they leave. Um, and so that's something that while we, you know, love the project-based learning component of our programs, we really want them to understand the fullness of the area that they're traveling. You know, and, um, and again, that, that's when we go and only travel and allow our students to see only a certain slice of the world <laughs> or certain aspects of the country, um, it is reaff reaffirming these single stories that they may have heard in, in certain ways that um, are very limiting. So that is something that we're pretty proud about that we've been able to find out more of our students' interests and what makes them drawn to that area 
um, and provide you know a more full experience for them, even though they're only there for about two to three weeks. They all kind of complain at a certain moment and say that it's pretty intense. We're always doing all this stuff, but you know it's important for them to get as much as they can while while they're there. And a lot of students in the past have actually taken it upon themselves to create their own programs and their own trips and travel back or create their own partnerships once in country or networking opportunities once in country that they plan on going back to or seeking out internships that they plan on going back to. Um, that our program offerings have broadened um, because more students, as our program offerings have broadened, broadened uh, it's attracted a more diverse um, crowd of students. Uh, with various academic interests, especially in the sciences, um, which is something that, you know, we were struggling a bit with over time because a lot of the programs were more humanities based, but, you know, there was a student need um, to pull in the sciences a bit more. And actually one of the trips that I led of a 2016 and 2017 was a program to Tanzania focused on sustainable development. Um, but it was, we had a variety of students with, uh, with various interests. Um, some of them were focused on um, in Africana studies at that time um, or had those interests even if they weren't pursuing that as a um, as an academic goal. They had personal interest in 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 Africana studies or to Tanzania or they were interested in the topic of sustainable development and so we had a pretty robust group. Um, we ended up the Humanities 180 course that's listed in, there in turn, under expanded course offerings has been something that we've been able to also adjust um, based on our needs as well. Uh, Humanities 180 is a three credit program that really focuses in on um, uh, getting, you know, a, a full a rounder picture of, of the area the, of the country, the destination, um, everything from their political, economic, cultural context and, and investigating that. It's an interdisciplinary study, so of course. And um, as a result of that, we're able to spin it the way we need to. Um, this past year, um, the Humanities 180 was contextualized for South Africa. We had students traveling to South Africa. In the past, it's been contextualized for Japan and or Tanzania. So there were a variety of ways we're able to kind of expand what we're able to offer um, without having to develop and go through the trickiness of developing an entire new course every single time. Um, we also have a business leadership. Uh, business leadership is, is an experiential course that was created for our Costa Rica program that was unfortunately canceled. Um, this past 2020 year, we had three programs we were running to Cambodia, Costa Rica, and South Africa. They were all unfortunately canceled, um, but out of the desire for the business students to want a, a business department to want a study abroad program tailored to their needs, a business leadership course uh, was developed. And again, um, I mentioned earlier, we had a, we have a new Black Studies degree program and this also uh, kind of came out of the interest, not just of um, faculty, but also students. I teach African Lit, I teach African American Lit at the college, and I always have students asking, when are you going to like, teach other courses, are there any other courses to offer um, limited in our offerings? And But what, what we found was through study abroad, through our connections, with, through our um, development of Humanities 180, there was a, a growing interest from students in wanting more of that, more of that. So we do have a Black Studies degree program that started this past fall, fall 2020. Sorry, fall 2019. Um, also, we found that we were more intentional about knowledge building um, in our pre-departure sessions. Um, and again, what some of what we the work that we were we're really focusing in on is not just you know what areas the students want to go to um where do they find certain things but also what are their preconceptions about the area and their and their i guess assumptions about how they fit or don't fit within their that space as well as 
um, <laughs> what things are they bringing with them in terms of their own biases to, to the destination as well. And so there's a lot of intentional questioning that helps them shift perspective over time, um, whether it's personal, academic, or professional. Um, sometimes it's almost like a pendulum swing. They had a certain perception of, for example, Tanzania, and then, you know, they're scared that something's going to happen, like they're going to get kidnapped or something, which is a common thing that we would hear, you know, and then all of a sudden it would shift to kind of the other direction, like, oh, everyone is Karaguni and welcoming and, you know, the whole culture is, <laughs> is lovely and there's not a bad apple amongst them, you know, and so uh, we kind of try to tease out the, the gray area, the in-between, um, that, that as well. So we do a lot of, through our coursework, as well as our follow-up work and our connections in country, and our cultural tour guides, we really get them to see the nuances um, within the culture while they're while they are there. Um, so when you're unsure, and I'm saying all of this so ideally, right? But you're not going to see everything. <laughs> there are things you're obviously going to miss as a faculty leader uh, when you travel. It's expected that unex you know expect the unexpected when you travel. We tell our students get. Um, comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> and so there are a lot of things that even in the midst of um, traveling there, uh, you won't see, there will be blind, blind spots. So the best thing is when you're unsure of how to deal with a student situation or experience, listen to the student, validate their experience and connect them with additional resources so that they feel supported. Um, and again, I think a lot of this comes back to kind of knowing your community, <laughs> connecting with your community as a way to prepare students for what they are going to be experiencing once they're in country. That's a, a very significant part of this. Um, I've been in, in experiences where as a student um, and as a Black student and as a Black student coming from an urban area attending a predominantly white institution, there was all this recruitment and work to get me and others of my kind to go there. And then once you're there, you know, the support, the connections, the resources are not there at all. And you're, you either have to kind of deal with it or, or leave. And so those are the things that I think um, a lot of the faculty who share those experiences and leave these trips at the college um, have not only experienced in their own personal lives, but they're they want to make sure that students, it informs how they design the program so students don't feel um, like they're just left, right? And they're just abandoned and that they have to figure things out for themselves. Now, the difference with our programs at the college, again, is that we move like a cohort throughout the entire program um, that will probably shift for other places who, you know, for other institutions who um, have students who independently go and travel. But I think that these ideas mm -hmm. of these ways of thinking about how you're designing your program still um, apply. Um, so there are so many resources uh, and I don't mind sharing some towards the end of all of this or sending some things to uh, Sabia and Julie and um, Dr. Eric Hartman. We can, I can send them to you. But here are some to start us off. <laughs> so they're from Diversity Abroad, which is a really excellent resource. Um, we see things like why you should go abroad. It, it, diversity abroad really does a great job of supporting students and their, you know, and their various identities and connecting them to resources, but also getting them to see what it's like to, um, from a student's perspective, to travel and and, and um, learn and navigate whatever region they're in, and so. I would highly recommend, if you're not aware of the resources Diversity Abroad has, to check a lot of them out. There's also a blog that I have a little further down, Fading in Between Worlds. I think blogs are becoming the go-to for a lot of the students. Um, I know one of, I had a student who was interested in traveling to France. This, this was last year, and she, uh, I mean, she was very direct. She said, I, I wanna travel, but I wanna know, should I be nervous about being black? female and Muslim, you know, when traveling. And so, you know, we talked a bit about, you know, where does she go to find those resources and those experiences. Um, so some of these blogs are really 
are really important um, resources as well. So I wouldn't discount those as those um, types of places. Social media, Instagram are great places for our students to go to find out about what it's like to to be black or transgender or you know Muslim or um, atheist, right or anything, right? We have so many resources that help our students kind of unpack and think through that and. And so uh, I can share those towards the end. So uh, I'm hoping that this will work. But the gist of this, it's go abroad. Uh, two of the founders are talking a bit about how, what their experiences were when traveling abroad as Black women and everything from, um, they talk about how sometimes people would stare at them and they weren't prepared for that when they were going to certain areas. Or one of the women talks about how she had a student who, um, I think she was in the Dominican Republic and she had a student who said, oh, she's beautiful. Um, and she, and the, the teacher was Responded, the woman who's speaking responded and said, oh, thank you, thank you. And the student said, yeah, you remind me of Beyonce. And then um, she said, oh, that's, that's nice. I always get mistaken for being Haitian. And then she says, oh, no, you're too pretty to be Haitian, right? And so they talk, yeah. So they talk about, um, you know, those sorts of experiences, experiences with colorism, um, with being fetishized, um, all of these things. So it's not just about, you know, you know, the cosmetic stuff, like how do I meet people who look like me, but also how do you prepare students for engaging in those sorts of things? Um, people taking pictures of them without permission, right? The same way I would tell students not to do that to someone else when they travel abroad and how we always talk about um, poverty porn and being respectful about you know, photography and what to take and what informs why, why we take the pictures that we take and props and using humans as props and things of that nature, right? We have these conversations, but, you know, what happens when th that's the student's experience when they're traveling and someone's treating them that way. So these, these are the things that we talk a bit about, unpack, um, um, and attempt to prepare students for. Um, this go abroad resource is really good at highlighting those sorts of issues, um, but as, as but also encouraging students. It's not off, you know. It's not off frightening, right? <laughs> encouraging the students that as long as they're supported by their community, you can study abroad. You don't have to be scared about traveling. You don't have to think that everywhere you know that at every turn you're going to be facing some sort of discrimination or some you know someone might assault you or all of these other things that might inform why they would want to study abroad in the first place or what their concerns are that they carry with them when they are traveling. Um, so to conclude, culturally relevant pedagogy as a framework for study abroad design and using empathy mapping as a tool can highlight our program limitations and create more intentional study abroad programs that actively resist affirming and replicating single stories. Uh, Chimamanda DJ states um, that if she quotes Palestinian poet Morid Barucci, I'm mis uh, mispronouncing that I know, um, but she, she writes that if you want to dispossess a people, the simplest way to do it is to tell their story and to start with secondly. She reaffirms that stories do matter. Many stories matter and stories have been used to dispossess and to malign but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. Um, and so uh, I guess I just want to leave off on that thought and then maybe um, welcome in any uh, experiences or any thoughts or things that people might want to share or questions, any questions that you know people might have. Can start sharing. off by sharing some things from the chat, some connections that have been made. Um, uh, a large connection has been made is about like the group dynamics topic. Um, so from Lara, Lara, we have a thanks for raising the group dynamics topic. In my experience as a host destination in South Africa, intergroup dynamics often overlooked 
are often overlooked, especially when the group of students are themselves diverse and don't realize how differently a program may land with students whose life experiences and identities offer, uh, differ from their own. This added to the cross-cultural experiences that can be very demanding for students, especially those who experience silencing or marginalizations. Um, we have Hannah who says, we've seen similar group dynamics play out and on SITs, customs programs uh, that are faculty-led. Um, their office has created specific materials to support faculty through this process. And this is a major part of the student experience. Um, it's super important to have a safe space created to debrief and impact those experiences. We have some resource sharing around that. Um, and we have Natalie amplifying the importance of all that has been said um, and having worked with students who have experienced significant trauma and pain during group educational travel experiences when faculty or leaders ignore or minimize issues like that. Um, we also have, um, yeah, I, so, mm -hmm, sorry, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. And I would just like to add another thing that I've been noticing with um, the students that join our program is, um, anxiety, a lot of anxiety, <laughs> and um, a rise in mental health issues. And I know that, you know, that's one of the major things that, um, that I guess, besides an earthquake, you'll find more people dealing with emotional issues, the disconnect from be, of being away from home. And so I think that uh, if that's kind of the general concern, just for all students in general, just think about what that might mean for students who, a student who has a, a, a ability challenge or um, they are definitely the minority in that area for a variety of reasons, or you're transgender and trying to navigate your way through the airport, right, or things of that nature. And I'm saying this from experience because I'm drawing directly from experiences that I've had with students who, um, it, 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 it exacerbates the anxiety, I think, right, like any sort of emotional, um, um, I would, I would like to say maybe that it, 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 displaces them in a different sort of way, right? Um, they are already feeling unsure about themselves when they travel and then there are all these other things and they probably feel as though not only are they away from their own safe spaces, but where do you go? Where do you connect with in that country? And so I think that um, it is important that, I, I, I know I'm repeating the idea of community building and connecting to the community resources and being able to have your students be aware of that as well as the faculty. Uh, I can't repeat that enough. That's one really, really important um, part of all of this. Absolutely. And I th think that it kind of leads to other um, comments and kind of questions about wanting to know more about like empathy mapping and different ways that it can be used. Um, and an affirmation that it's just such an important question to consider that like, can you create culturally responsive programming for a community that you're not a part of? Um, kind of right. being aware of that, yeah. So could you share, like, do you have like, oh. other resources or like things about empathy mapping or um, different ways that can be used? Oh yeah, I can. How would you like me to send that to you? Do you want me to just put things in the chat or should I email them and you send it out to, how would, how would you like that to be managed there? There are a lot. Um, I have, um, th the slide itself is kind of a really basic, practical tool for just getting to the students' needs. What do you see? How are you experiencing things? What do you feel? Um, and, and we, again, at the college, I have tailored that a little bit for our students, depending on what the purpose is, right, when what we need it for. And so if people want me to send that out, I can do that and maybe can be attached to um, wherever we're placing the webinar and the presentation slides. Yeah. I can add that all in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Julie. Um, we have another um, kind of question related to empathy mapping, but beyond program design. Um, if you have any examples of that. Of empathy mapping beyond program design? Yes. So is it, I'm going to make sure I heard that correctly. I'm breaking up a little. Bit. Um, yeah. I. I uh, I mean, I think just in general, these are human questions <laughs> that you would just ask. Uh, um, the, the, the type of questions they're asking, I guess, are ways that when you want to really get to know students in your classroom even, right, um, besides 
just studying abroad, but students in your classroom, how you're thinking of um, who's in the class, how that's informing how you're designing even your syllabus, for example. I think that those are certain questions to anticipate, um, everything from the reading selections to what types of conversations you're having and how you're framing those conversations. Um, I think it's a good tool to use just in general, person to person, personally, like these are very, um, these are questions that force you to kind of think about things from someone else's perspective and not your own. Um, and it's something that the faculty leaders, uh, you know, we work on quite often. What does that mean to see or experience this place we've gone to or that we're from, from, you know, a st other students' perspective, um, who's not only ever been, never been there, but also has quite of a different um, background than you might have, right? Um, I also think it's a good way for students, once they're in the country, to connect with others locally, right? And what they're seeing and who they're seeing and how they're engaging with folks within the host country. So I think, I mean, besides something mapping, and the, I, if, if I remember correctly, I think it came out of organizational leaderships, <laughs> organizational leadership, like uh, that, that side of the world. So people have taken it and used it for a variety of things outside of um, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. So I think it lends itself to really anything you need um, in terms of designing a program or um, building up morale within a group, <laughs> you know, whether it's a classroom or whether it's a business, you know. Um, so it, it, yeah, it, it has, it's multifunctional. I'm not sure if I answered your question directly. I hope I did though. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Caitlin. Uh, she says, as a program coordinator, I'm charged with supporting faculty leaders, not developing and leading programs herself. Uh, do you have any ideas about how to nudge leaders to consider and implement these topics? In her experience, some are more interested in the academic and travel preparation rather than the intercultural learning and addressing the needs of different groups. Um, so, I guess it depends. I mean, and, and that's that's a little bit tricky um, because what I want to say is, is there a way to um, make that part of the college policy, the study abroad policy, that there are certain things that must happen in developing, you know, your program design, right? Um, and I don't know with bureaucracy how easy of a thing that is to do at various institutions or who is in the position of power to be able to implement that as a policy or what that even has to go through but i think it has to be an, it has to be an institutional priority really right um they have to see the the importance or purpose of that um as an as a culture right as an institutional culture that these things are important and we're not just paying lip service to it that it, it, it is informing i mean culturally relevant pedagogy is not just only about study abroad, right? It's kind of getting us to think about how we interact with folks from various backgrounds, really at the core of it, right? And how as educators, we meet those, all of those needs, um, even if we don't share that experience. It's, I mean, at the core of it, that's what it's getting us to pay attention to in classrooms or otherwise. If that, if your institution is not holding that as, an, as a priority for the students that it serves, then there's a bigger problem. So <laughs> I think the first step is really that it should, I mean, it really needs to become institutional priority and then everything trickles down, right? <laughs> um, so I, I, I might've missed some details out of it, but I think I gather that they're a coordinator, they help to coordinate it, but they don't help to build or design. Um, at our institution, since it is faculty led, we also have a selection com committee and these are things we pay attention to. So if there's a similar process at other institutions, maybe that's another, um, intentional way of making sure that programs uh, are meeting the needs of students in a, in a significant way. Um, I've had students come back and tell me, uh, I debrief students once they return and, you know, I've seen when things go wrong because of these cultural disconnects or a gen, you know, or a microaggression that happened in cutting the, you know, and, and a 
lot of things happen when hangry, when you're hangry, right? There are a lot of incidents that, you know, when you're around someone, it's a stressful time or travel isn't going well and all these travel stressors, um, the way that people, I think, um, may deal with just those basic things that tend to go wrong um, can escalate, right? It can escalate. So I've had situations where it just be, it was simply about maybe a student having um, an issue with a faculty member and they were both tired and then it became this other the student was pretty upset about it right and um, so those I've seen situations where a program can almost be ruined <laughs> by those sorts of things when you're not they're really connected to the needs of the students some I mean even if it's dietary needs you know something just as basic, you know, just as accessible as that, right? What are your eating needs even, right? And where do we go to find that and meet that? Those are important. And when that doesn't happen, um, I can see where things really go awry and how it can ruin the experience, not just for the student and or the faculty member, but the group as a whole, because you're moving as a community when you're traveling to these places. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question myself. Um, you mentioned um, how a lot of like the exercises um, attached to like, cu like culturally responsive pedagogy um, like help develop like a voice, uh, like a sense of agency and like leadership skills and kind of like more attuned like resource sharing among students. Um, and I'm curious if, like how um, like it sounds like a, like a sense of self is kind of like affirmed along with like affirming um, the skill sets of, of um, black students and like other minoritized students. So I was wondering if you saw any shift of kind of like self representation or like alignment or disalignment with the identities that they were coming in to these programs with? All of the above, yes. <laughs> yes, all of the above. Um, and it depends on the region we were traveling to and what the context of the program was, but I have seen students who um, sought out, especially for students who are traveling to Tanzania and South Africa, they had really particular interests, personal interests. Um, they, they saw the continent as an ancestral home and they went forward with it. And some of them had very romanticized notions of what that would be like um, and who they would meet or interact with. And so uh, there was a lot of unpacking there, uh, not just for the students, but the faculty as well. One of the years that we traveled, uh, we had won a Title VI um, uh, grant um, from NEH, and we were able to bring a group of diverse faculty members as well as students on a fellowship to Tanzania. Um, and so the the faculty as well who traveled were except with the exception of one all black and but from different places some black americans some caribbean right and so um and african and so i think that um when it became an emotional process let's say that <laughs> for a lot of for a lot of the people who traveled there um, because of their perception of what it would be like to travel back home and what that means. And so I think that's something that when at different moments on the trip, it was challenged um, about what it means to come from a global home, right? Um, or reaffirmed, you know, with people saying, you're welcome, welcome back, brother, welcome back, sister. You know, um, Ghana's doing, right? Ghana's doing a lot of intentional work surrounding this as well, connecting diasporans, yeah. Um, and so a, a lot of the students and faculty members would receive that and they would feel kind of affirmed right there. <laughs> the ways of thinking about the trip when they started out were definitely affirmed. But, you know, again, we are not all one thing. And so, you know, I think there are challenges there, there as well. Uh, there was always this question of authenticity. Um, when it comes to the experiences that they were all having. Um, but I, I would like to say that um, the most significant shift maybe I saw in, in the students, uh, one student 
big political science, um, you know, buff, and he was, I, I think he decided that he was going to change his major to Africana studies when he graduated, once he graduated and transferred over to Temple, um, just because of all the challenges to what he realized were um, images he was getting from 90s media, especially like hip hop, <laughs> right, and things of that nature, right? So he realized that there's a lot of learning there to do when it comes to the way he was thinking about the continent and the identities therein. Um, um, there was one student we stopped in Kenya, I think at one point, and then um, briefly, and then Tanzania, and one of the students, as soon as we left out of the airport, he like started crying and touched the ground, and then took a picture of him touching the ground, right? And so that was, a, I mean, that was his hallmark moment, you know, um, that he felt a sense of returning, even though, you know, he said that he knows that that you know his ancestry came more from the west but you know it was just the idea of being there you know um that was meaningful to him um he's also a history a big history buff as well on that same trip and so um there are other students who again shifted majors who uh wanted to travel back again <laughs> to south africa a couple did actually go back again um, in a different context. We have students who are, who are, you know, then it was only two or three weeks, right? So you're, you're only getting a snippet of the, of, of, of anything really. So I think it's the beginning of a shift, you know, it's not about this kind of end or finite point that you get to. It's like the beginning of unpacking things. I think all of the empathy mapping work we're talking about and the writing things along is an intentional way of getting people to kind of reconsider the things that they've been taught through the media, they've learned, they've heard about themselves, people who look like them and or who don't, right? Um, and who, and even just the idea of travel, the black people don't travel, for example, right? You know, and seeing you represented either as a leader. Um, I don't know if I would have had the conversations, if I would have been privy to some of these conversations from some students, if I, you know, wasn't identified as a black female who travels. Um, they felt a little bit more comfortable coming and talking to to me about very specific things. Um, and that slide, the slide, uh, and I'll, sh I'll send a link to that, that was one of the things that, it's kind of the thing that wasn't said. Um, she's going into this advisor's office. She's a young black female. He's an, he's an older white man. And she's scared to ask the questions she really wants to know. You know, and so I think that it's, it's the kind of like the beginning of seeing yourself represented in something at the same time unpacking what that means and, you know, all the maybe romanticized notions or misconceptions you have surrounding that. And this is, you know, you're slowly unpacking it. So a lot of the students either shift their personal perspective on things. There's a lot of gratefulness, <laughs> you know, as well, that whole, well, you know, I came back, I'm so grateful to, you know, have the things that I have in a real way. Um, attitude shifting. Um, when we went to Tanzania, there was a lot of talk about, you know, they have, they, everyone is, you're, you're welcome. Karabuni is, you're welcome. You're all welcome. And we all, that was kind of the running joke, Karabuni, everything. They all have a welcoming attitude, right? single story <laughs> so um but the students really gravitated towards that and felt that that was something that they could take into as kind of like a philosophy to pull them through, you know to be a philosophy of gratefulness i guess and and welcoming and being welcome to um experiences to other perspectives to other opportunities to travel or um connect with community a lot of the students also took it upon themselves as kind of these leaders to simply go to their local libraries, talk to young kids. <laughs> I traveled, I went here, you should go, this is great. They would say, Where, when can I get the next opportunity to do something else like this? You know, I'll help you, can I be an uh, ambassador or something along those lines, you know? And so, um, you know, a lot of them really were um, excited about the fact that they could be seen in that light by, um, you know, people in their neighborhoods who, didn't think travel was possible or think travel was possible to those particular regions or maybe they're the first ones to even travel not just outside of their neighborhood but just out of the country right some of the students haven't even left their neighborhood except to come to the school to college right and so um 
So there's a lot of unpacking that happens in a very short amount of time. It's pretty intense. We do an exercise during the trip called the Rose and the Thorn. What's well, a good thing <laughs> and not so great thing about the day, right? And what you experienced. And it's our kind of easy, easy way at the end of a long day to talk, to, you know, connect with them, like with the empathy map, right? It's just another tailored way we do that. And we get to find out how to readjust ourselves as program leaders each day, the next day, once we have those conversations. What worked, what didn't work, what should we absolutely avoid next time? <laughs> you know, are there service providers that um, microaggressed our students even? And we didn't think that was gonna happen, but when we're in country, the, they're saying these things, you know, that's happened before. So it gets you to kind of rethink <laughs> a lot, moving into how you run and design the program the next time around. So I'm hoping I answered that question. I felt like I talked a bit around it, but I hope- No, that was absolutely that. wonderful. Thank you so much. I right. like definitely have a lot to like think about and <laughs> continuing to build like Lab Tuma specifically, but yeah, thank you so much. Oh, no problem. This is great. <laughs> thank you thank you all i'm hoping i know it, it felt like i was like breaking in and out so i'm hoping people heard me during the presentation okay yeah yeah it came across great um so yeah we're pretty close to time here i just want to oh wow okay <laughs> i know bye, -bye. <laughs> are there any other questions before um we wrap up if so um you can always email eric or um connect through the collaborative website, which I'll link to in a minute. So um, I just want to thank Professor Bayakanga again for your time and sharing all of your resources with us. Um, thank you. Thank you all for being here and listening. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have just a couple wrap up items. I'm just going to quickly share my screen so that everyone can see the upcoming webinars that the collaborative is hosting. Um, so there's a few coming up in September and October, and I will drop a link to the um, blog where you can find out more details and oops, that skipped. Um, find out more details and register. So that is here. And along with that link, there's also a very, very short feedback survey that we would really appreciate if you um, take uh, just a minute to complete and let us know what you thought about today um, on our part and um, if you have any tips for us doing webinars moving forward. So with that, you can copy and paste these links into your browser. I think that works best. Um, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar along with slides, and we'll do the video clips and any other resources um, that were shared today. So we'll email that all out to everyone who registered, and it will also be posted on the blog there. So you can keep an eye out for that next week. And that's all I have. So I will just say thank you all again and have wonderful weekends. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care.